Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to FRC. I want to welcome all of you who are joining us live at our headquarters here in downtown Washington, D.C. And for all of you who are watching via live web stream, whether Facebook Live or on FRC.org. So today we're going to learn how to win an argument. Now, gentlemen, if you think this is an argument about how learn how to win an argument with your wife, you've already <laughs> lost that battle. Um, if you don't know by now, the answer is yes, dear, you're absolutely right. And then move on with your life. Uh, but we're gonna, today we're going to talk about how to win an argument that's very important on how to save the lives of the unborn. And today to help us win that argument is Josh Brum. Uh, Josh Brum is the president of the Equal Rights Institute based in Charlotte, North Carolina. And I had the opportunity to actually meet Josh and hear his presentation at the Students for Life conference this past January here in D.C. And what I was struck with in his presentation was how he equipped young pro-life activists uh, with ways to persuasively communicate to those who are pro-choice, but also how to be relational as well. Uh, just, just like sometimes when we're sharing the gospel, as you know, sometimes it takes uh, you know, a few times to share the gospel with someone before uh, they understand it and their hearts are kind of captured by it. Well, same thing with the pro-life issue. And Josh did an incredible job of communicating to young pro-life activists how to, to do just that. Uh, the reason Josh is so equipped to be able to do, to do this because he's been in the pro-life movement for the past 18 years. Uh, and that's led him to actually publicly debate uh, some leaders in, uh, from Planned Parenthood and the, Nas the National Abortion Rights Action League as well. Uh, so he is very well equipped. He is a regular uh, blogger for LifeNews.com, and he also has a podcast that I'm sure he'll tell you a little bit more about as well. Most importantly, Josh has been married to his wife, Hannah, for the past 11 years, and they have three sons. Uh, so why don't you give a big FRC welcome to Josh Brown. It's an honor to be here. Several years ago, I was speaking at a Catholic conference. And when I wasn't speaking kind of in workshops, I was manning a booth. And so I, there's this one point I'll never forget. I was just hanging out this booth watching, you know, hundreds of people walk by, kind of ignoring because most people ignore those booths. But this one kid kind of locks eyes with me, and he walks up to me. I say kid. He's like a, he's, he's a college student. And he looked vaguely familiar, but I couldn't quite place it, which is something that happens to me like every day. Um, but he recognizes me. So he, he locks eyes with me, he comes up to me, he's like, Josh, how's it going? And I was like, hi, you know, I'm like trying to, I was like, ah. And he could tell, I did, but he was really, really sweet. He said, I'm Michael. We talked at Fresno State University a few months ago. And then I remembered, I, remember, I actually remember having a really great conversation with Michael. And I said, hi, how's it going? And he said, I'm doing great. I'm pro-life now. And I asked him the question. I always ask people who tell me that. I said, what changed your mind? And he said, you know, I just kept thinking about that thing that you said about how all humans are equal. You see, I'd made an argument to him called the equal rights argument that I'm going to spend the bulk of my time on uh, talking about today. And arg the argument that we have seen changed more pro-life minds on the spot than any other argument in our campus work. And to Michael's credit, he wasn't intellectually lazy about it. He didn't kind of ignore the fact that his arguments had been beaten uh, or that he didn't have a counter to my argument. He kept thinking about it. He kept wrestling him, uh, with that fact, which, which is what I would like everyone to do when, when they kind of find up uh, an argument like that. He kept thinking about it, and then he became pro-life. So today I want to talk to you about that argument because we found it to be most effective. First, I'll just give you a little bit of background. I knew I wanted to be a pro-life speaker when I was 11 years old. So this is no surprise to me. 22 years ago, uh, as a homeschooled kid, I found out about abortion. I read uh, Dr. Frank Beckwith's uh, first book on abortion, Politically Correct Death. Didn't understand half of it, but I read it. And then I found some tapes, or my parents gave me some tapes, from kind of the first guy to popularize uh, pro-life apologetics named Scott Klusendorf. Um, and when people would ask me what I wanted to be when I grew up, I would tell them I wanted to be a pro-life speaker. Basically, I meant I wanted to be Scott Klusendorf when I grew up. Uh, and so I knew exactly what it was. Like, I, I had this, this, this urge, like, I want to be able to try to help stop this thing. Um, and I've been doing full-time pro-life work since I was 18. So I'm, I'm 33 now and uh, just so excited to be in a place where, like, I, I felt a very strong calling from God of what I was going to be doing from a very early stage in my life, and I'm so excited to be doing it. So I'm having a great day. 
Um, so one of the, it was only about three and a half years ago that my brother Tim, a philosophy grad from Biola, and I got together. We, we were spending a week together. Our plan was to work on, our, on a book project. And we worked on that for like half a day. And then we just started talking about the pro-life movement um, and what we felt like could be done better. And, and we, have a, we had a very similar visions for the way that pro-life dialogue ought to be. What should it look like when pro-life and pro-choice people talk to each other? Uh, like, what would it look like if Jesus talked to a pro-choice person? I'm fascinated by that question. What would his body language be like? What kinds of questions would he ask? What kinds of questions would he not ask? And what would it sound like when he gave arguments, uh, like, like truthful arguments, not holding back from the truth, but spoken with gentleness and grace and reverence? Like, what would that look like? I wanna, we want to help pro-life people to get closer to that mark um, because this is a very, very important issue. Everyone knows that. That's why you're watching. Um, but how do we actually change pro-choice minds? It is very hard to change pro-choice minds because people's views about abortion connect to a lot of their deepest views about things, their, their, their views about sex and responsibility and what is a parent and all these things come into play. Um, but we've seen people change their minds about abortion. And what we're really interested in is not just uh, true arguments, meaning like that there's lots of uh, logically valid pro-life arguments. We're interested in what are the ones that actually connect in pro-choice minds, people who are thinking differently than us, usually coming from different maybe uh, religious backgrounds, different political backgrounds. What will help them? And what helps, especially if, like we're focused on young, uh, like you know, pro-choice high school and college students, what will change their minds? Well, because culture changes, pro-choice high school and college students today think differently in general than they did 10 years ago. That changes everything about what we do. Because that means that when we go into college campuses, there's a primary reason that we're talking to pro-choice people. It's not just because we want to change this individual's mind that day or do our best. A college campus is our laboratory. That's, we love R&D. We, we have a value at ERI of being innovative and flexible with our material because uh, if it's true that people change, that cultures change, then what is most persuasive will also change. And so when we go into campus, Roy's basically trying to beat our own arguments. Can we find new arguments that work better than the stuff that we've taught before? Or are there dialogue techniques or ways of using body language or questions that seem to help our dialogues go better? We're trying to, we're not just thinking about the arguments themselves, but how do we create an atmosphere, uh, an environment where people feel more open-minded, where they can hear our arguments better, where they feel even more emotionally safe to do that. We're thinking about those things too. Um, and so we've been doing this work now for, the, for about three years now. Um, and one of the, like, e easily the most uh, kind of extreme story of trying a new argument and seeing it work really well is the equal rights argument. Um, so a little bit of context uh, for kind of the part of the abortion discussion that we're talking about, because the abortion discussion is a very broad one. It touches a lot of things that I'm not going to cover today. Um, I'm only going to cover this argument that is responding to pro-choice people who argue that the unborn is not a person. So on college campuses, we don't hear that many people anymore saying the unborn is not biologically alive or that it's not biologically human. It happens, it doesn't happen that often. Not on college campuses. On Facebook debates, yes, but that's a whole different thing. Uh, but on college campuses, for the most part, we are having conversations about the two major disagreements between pro-life and pro-choice people. One is, what is the moral status of the unborn? Are the unborn uh, valuable persons like you and me, or are, they, or are they something else? And then the other disagreement has to do with bodily autonomy. Um, even if the unborn is a person, should a woman be able to choose abortion anyway because of bodily rights? I'm tabling that entire discussion. It's a fascinating discussion. Maybe I'll come back later and we can, we can do that sometime. Uh, but what, what the, the equal rights argument responds to is people who are saying, okay, it's alive. It's a member of the human species, but it's not like you and me. It's not valuable in the same way, so it shouldn't have the same rights as you and me. A, a, a pregnant woman should have more rights uh, than this child, be, or they wouldn't say child, of course, they would say this thing, this fetus, whatever, um, because it's different in some really important way. Um, before I explain the equal rights argument, I was going to explain a couple of reasons why I think it is so persuasive. We've been thinking about this argument a lot for, for several years. Uh, the, 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 the genesis here is um, my brother Tim and uh, my colleague Steve Wagner at Justice for All uh, one of our favorite campus outreach organizations, heard this 
personate argument uh, from Dr. J.P. Moreland at Biola, this brilliant philosophy professor. And they tweaked it a bit, kind of modified it for, for use on campuses, and then we all started trying it. I started trying it. Uh, this was before ERI even existed. And then you know, a whole bunch of pro-life advocates across the country went on the campuses and started trying it. And again, like we've never seen like one of these tests, one of these laboratory tests work so well. I've never seen anything change more minds on the spot. And most people don't change their minds on the spot. Most people change their minds months later at best. But we do sometimes see people change their minds. And by far, we've seen them change the most, their, their minds the most often because of this argument. It actually got to the point where we would have these debrief sessions after our outreaches. Like, we've kind of taken down all of our gear, and we're sitting in a circle on the grass, and we're just kind of talking about our days. And it got to where it was kind of the same thing every time. You know, a student would raise their hand and say, I saw someone become pro-life today. I say, oh, really? What happened? Oh, I used the equal rights argument. It's like, all right. You know, it's like, I've heard this story now. I've heard this story dozens and dozens and dozens of times. Um, but I think that's because it is so persuasive. So a few reasons why this is so persuasive. One, it is very obviously not a religious argument. Um, when we're talking to uh, pro-choice atheists and, agnost uh, and agnostics, we're not using uh, primarily religious arguments. I'm not starting with like Psalm 139 or Jeremiah 1.5 or second trimester John the Baptist kicked in his mother's womb in the presence of first trimester Jesus. Like that's not gonna work <laughs> with an atheist. Um, because they, because they, you know, like I, I believe that the Bible is a source for truth, but they don't. So we're starting kind of on on a on a level that where we have common ground of science and philosophy. I want to show them that uh, the 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 Christian worldview is very very reasonable um, on views like abortion. And so we sometimes those discussions turn religious eventually. Sometimes they don't. It depends. We think every conversation is a series of difficult judgment calls amidst prayer without ceasing. Um, and so. We all started testing this argument, and we, and we found it to work so well. So um, it's not a religious argument. And it's also helpful because we purposely are taking a short break in the conversation from talking about abortion. I um, mean, that can actually be good for the conversation because when people are talking about abortion and they disagree, a lot of times they're tense. They're in fight mode. They're like, m like super focused on preventing your argument from beating their argument versus like paying attention to whether your argument actually does defeat their argument. And so sometimes kind of helping them to kind of relax a little bit and get them reconnected with something that they are probably very passionate about can be a very good thing. And that thing is equality. Equality is something that my generation maybe cares about more than anything else. I've got a friend who is a, 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 a lawyer, and when she, was, she told me that when she was studying, she was taught that if she could prove when she's arguing her case that equality is on her side, she can basically stop arguing. So it's an instant win. My generation cares so much about equality, you all know that. Um, and so we're getting them in touch with that, and that's exactly what I want to do. Because what I'm about to do is I'm going to put a tension in their minds. I'm going to put a tension for them in between them being pro-choice and them being pro-equality. I'm going to argue that for them to truly be pro-equality, they have to be pro-life. And that is sometimes enough for them to do the massive thing of changing their minds because a lot of people that I talk to care more about being able to self-identify as someone who is pro-equality than being someone who is pro-choice. So I'm going to argue that for them to be pro-equality, they have to be pro-life. So here's kind of how the argument is structured. There's three questions in the beginning of it. The first question is this, do we have an equal right to life? The second question is, do you think that means there's something the same about us, which sort of naturally leads to the last question, what's the same about us? Um, an, an important point here, the word we and do we have an equal right to life does not refer to the unborn. Fetal personhood is not in premise one of this argument or else this would be a very circular argument. What we're doing is we're sort of just conceding the fact that for our culture and for most philosophers, fetuses are not obvious cases of persons. So what we're doing is we are focusing on the most clear case of persons, human adults. And what we're going to do in the conversation is we're going to go deeper on that. We're going to try to ask some, some kind of deep questions about that and get them thinking deeper about uh, this obvious case and then apply that knowledge to the less clear case of the unborn. So that's what's going on. Now, this isn't the way the argument sounds when I use this in real time. This is sort of the skeleton of the argument. Um, we've got a much more organic way of, of explaining it. So I'll, I'll kind of explain that. Um, in fact, I'll, I'll use a story. So last spring, we were at UC Davis, 
in the most volatile outreach that I've ever been a part of. UC Davis is not the most pro-free speech uh, campus that we've ever been on. And uh, there were a lot of pro-choice people uh, very angry that we were there. They, were, they protested us. One, yeah, it's, it's better than Berkeley. I am happy that it's better than Berkeley, although we want to do outreach at Berkeley and kind of get to test that our, ourselves. We'll see what happens. Um, but be, and eventually, I'm literally sitting on our, on our table where we kind of had this poll set up. Um, we don't put graphic pictures on signs. What we do is we just kind of uh, ask a question like, should abortion remain legal? Should it be legal up to 20 weeks? Something like that. And we have a yes option and a no option and an it depends option. We're just trying to attract people to come to us. It's not a real poll. We just want people to come and talk to us. But I'm literally sitting on our poll table and a very angry protester came up and vandalized all of our stuff, kind of pushed our stuff off the table and everyone cheered for her and got pretty intense. Before it got really intense, though, um, I'm having the, oh, I, I didn't put the picture up. I'm oh, sorry. Uh, I was having this conversation with these three pro-choice uh, students. And for a while, uh, they were just kind of venting at me. Uh, but eventually, to her credit, one of them asked me about my views. She said, I want to know why you're here. What's your argument? And I said, I think I could explain to you in about two minutes why I'm pro-life. And she said, go. What would you do with that two minutes? This is what I did. I said, I'm a really open-minded person. I'm open-minded. I, 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 I am open to being wrong about all of my views except two of them. Uh, two plus two is four in a base 10 system. Uh, if that's not true, then nothing works uh, in my own existence. Everything else is on a spectrum of confidence for me. There are some views that I'm very confident in, the pro-life view, some form of Christianity being true. There are some things that I'm very not confident in, and everything else is on this spectrum. This basically means I'm a very uncomfortable person. Uh, I hold my views with a pretty open hand, and my friends who are 100% sure that they're right about everything are just more comfortable. Um, and so I'm an open-minded person, I said, but there is one of my views that would be very hard for you to change my mind on. And it's this, that everyone that I can see right now has an equal right to life. So we were outside at, at, at the quad at UC Davis. So there's, this is where like most people have lunch. We could easily see hundreds of people right now. I said, look around. I think everyone here has an equal right to life. It would be very hard for you to change my mind about that. But there's something kind of interesting about that view, isn't there? Uh, there's a lot of differences. I said, look around. I see some people who are tall and some people who are short. I see some people who are really smart. And I see some people who are, you know, trying their best. Um, you've also got people who are good at sports and good at music and those that are not. I've seen uh, at least four people in wheelchairs today. There's all these differences. So how can we possibly explain this thing that we both agree on? Basically, everyone in Western civilization agrees that we have an equal right to life. But how can we explain that? when there are so many differences. Usually at this point I would stop and let them respond and we'd go that way, but C only gave me two minutes, so I just kept going. Uh, I said, I think there must be something that we all have in common. And this is key, you can't miss this. It's got to be something that we all have equally. It cannot be something that you can get in degrees. It can't be a degreed property. In other words, it can't be like a dimmer switch. It's got to be like a light switch. It's got to be an all or nothing kind of a thing. It can't be something you can have more or less of because we're trying to ground equality. So if someone's like, oh, yeah, humans are all equal because they're all intelligent. <laughs> That's not going to do the job of explaining equality, right? Because we're not all equally intelligent. If you don't believe that, you can just go to YouTube and read the comments under the first video that pops up. Like, you'll see, some people think better than others. And that's okay. They still have an equal right to life. I'm pro-equal rights for obnoxious internet trolls. I'm just saying intelligence is not going to be the thing that we all have in common equally. We're looking for a non-degreed property. It's got to be something that you, can, you, you either have or you don't. What could that thing be? Now, there are lots of, lots of pro-choice answers to this. I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, in this case, once again, I only had two minutes, so I just gave her my answer. I said, I think it is something like humanness, something like being human. Um, then if, uh, and that would explain a lot of data about the world. I would explain like a lot of like when, when, when I kind of think about the world and, uh, and equality, like that, that seems to make the most sense to me uh, com you know, when I compare it to all the other answers that I've heard. Um, and if the unborn have that thing, which they totally do, then it seems like we have to give them an equal right to life, regardless of what our like, intuitions are about them. And the last thing I said, I always say this, I said, notice this is not a religious argument, and it's also not an emotional argument. Like, I am not pro-life for emotional reasons. I'm not pro like, I don't get the warm fuzzies when I look at a picture of an embryo. I don't. 
I don't get that thing like when I'm like when my friends like you know recently I had friends post their, a picture of their newborn baby on Facebook, um, and in this case it was cute you know so there's that like that's not always true but they, they pictured a cute <laughs> newborn baby it's okay they still have an equal right to life uh, but you know uh, they put a picture of the cute baby and I had that reaction that basically everyone except sociopaths have which is like oh the baby you know I had that reaction I don't get that when I look at a picture of a zygote I don't it looks like a fuzzy orange to me. I'm not pro-life for emotional reasons. I said I'm pro-life because it is the most rational conclusion that I can come to. Because I'm starting with equality as premise one. I am very, very confident in equality, and I'm reasoning from there. And I have just not yet heard, and I've heard dozens of attempts, but I have not heard a pro-choice explanation for personhood um, that makes more sense than this one, that, that, that ends up making sense and also disqualifies the unborn. That's how we're making the argument. We're trying to show them, like, look, uh, can we agree human adults are equal? We have an equal right to life. Why? We're trying to go deeper on that. What is the thing? It seems like we must have at least one thing in common, and it's got to be something that we have equally. What could that thing be? I think it's something like humanists, but for a lot of pro-choice people, they think it's something else. They think that you need to be viable. They think you need to be sentient. They think you need to be self-aware. They think you need to be able to feel pain. Like, there's all this, you know, dozens of things that we hear. Um, and so kind of the next part of this argument is how do we respond to these alternative explanations for personhood? Um, so what's happening whenever a purchase person says to me, okay, I think the thing that we have equal, uh, that we have equally is not humanist or anything like that. I think it's like sentient, like being minimally aware of the world around you. Like I think once you have that, then you're in. Um, then what's going to happen in my head is I'm going to run that worldview through sort of a rubric. I'm going to ask three test questions to kind of assess their worldview. These sort of th the, 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 the three questions are this. Does this explanation entail equal rights for adults? It almost always does. If it doesn't even do that, it like miserably fails as, as a good argument for equality. Um, but then I'll ask, does this explanation entail equal rights for infants? Because as a father who's been there for the birth of my three sons, uh, my view that newborns have an equal right to life, for me, is basically a properly basic belief. Like, I can make an argument for it. I'm not convinced I should have to. Um, I think that one should be a properly basic belief for just about everybody. Um, and then the last question would be, does this explanation entail equal rights for animals? I don't think it should. Now, I, I never say this out loud. This is just what's going on in my head. What I'll say out loud is I'll run them through a thought experiment. I think stories are very helpful. And so my brother Tim came up with a really helpful thought experiment here that we call the Z shooting. So let's say we're talking to a purchase person who has said, I think what gets you in. So like imagine there's an equal right to life circle. Everything inside the circle gets an equal right to life. Everything outside of it doesn't. We're looking for what goes in the circle, right? And so let's say they say for sake of argument sentience. You've got to be minimally aware of the world around you. Then we're going to say, okay, cool. Let's think about that. Imagine we're hanging out at the zoo. We're hanging out in front of the elephant exhibit when a gunman shows up. And he gets six bullets fired before he's tackled by Chuck Norris. It's not funny to call the students, but sometimes with, with older audiences, they get it. Okay, whatever. It's funny to me. Uh, they're tackled by security, whatever. Uh, and so let's think about those six bullets. The first bullet goes into the bushes and kills the world's unluckiest cockroach which I think is funny because I'm kind of twisted like that. Like just the thought of anything being that unlucky, I think is kind of funny. Uh, the second bullet kills a squirrel. The third bullet kills an elephant. It was a big bullet. The fourth bullet kills a newborn. The fifth bullet kills a toddler. And the sixth bullet kills an adult stock photo model. Okay, now here's the question. How many of these things should be in the equal right to life circle? Like, given, like uh, uh, assuming that this person's right, that, 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 that being minimally aware of the world around you is what gets you in. Like, we're not asking what is the law right now. I don't care. What should the law be? How many of these things should have an equal right to life? Well, under the view that sentience is what gets you in, I count six. They're all minimally aware of the world around them. And that is the biggest problem with this view. And this is where we push back. There's a squirrel problem here. Squirrels are now in the equal right to life circle and they just shouldn't be. Now, I wanna be clear. I can find common ground with um, a lot of animal rights activists. Like I'm not, like my view is not just because animals are not equally valuable to humans means we can do whatever we want with them. That's not my view. I think the fact that chickens and cows can feel pain morally matters. So I'm concerned about the way that we treat chickens and cows on factory farms. That's where I'm at. 
um, because it morally matters, like the fact that they can feel pain, we should treat them accordingly. Um, I don't think that there should be killer whales or dolphins in SeaWorld at this point, or things like SeaWorld, like that's my view. I don't agree with everything in the documentaries, The Cove and Blackfish, but I am convinced that because of the kinds of things that dolphins and killer whales can do, that should affect the way that we treat them. So I can find a lot of common ground. I just can't agree with the person who says like humans and animals are equal. Or sometimes we talk to extremists who are like animals are more valuable than humans because at least they're not destroying the planet. Um, like that's not where we're at. And we will give pushback. We'll push back against those views. Um, I was on a train one time from uh, going from Bakersfield to Fresno. I just come from an outreach at Pasadena City College and I was sitting across from this guy who was getting into robotics. Uh, he had this big old thick textbook and he wants to be on the team that creates the world's first artistic robot. So we talked about iRobot and the three laws of robotics and art and things like that. And then after, eventually he asked me about what I do, which I have a very strange job. Um, I try to help pro-lifers to not be weird is basically my, my job. Um, and so we started talking about the outreach that I just had at, at Pasadena. And I just, one of the things that I kind of uh, told him, was, like this observation, was that I talked to pro-choice people from all walks of life. I talked to a lot of atheists and agnostics. I also talked to a lot of pro-choice people from lots of religions. And yet almost everybody that I talked to agrees that there is something special about humans. And he said, oh no, my girlfriend would disagree. <laughs> and I said, really? Like, I don't think so he would. And he's like, no, I'll prove it to you. If she ever accidentally kills a bug, she has a moment of silence. <laughs> I thought about that for a second. I said, I don't, I don't think that your girlfriend thinks humans and animals are the same. Because, and I'll prove it to you. If she ever accidentally like, ran over a kid, she wouldn't just have a moment of silence. <laughs> Right? Like, you are you tracking? Like, it would at least wreck her day. It would probably be the worst thing that ever happened to her. But, like, it's not going to be like this, like, she's going to get out of the car and go, namaste and move on. It's going to be an event. It's going to be a moment um, in her life. It's going to be a big thing. Um, and so, and, Siri, and not, all Calif Cal uh, not all Californians talk like this, but he but literally, he was like, dude. I thought about that for a second. I think you're right. <laughs> I'm going to go talk to her about that tonight. And so they had an amazing evening together. But anyway, it's like, <laughs> the, and he was on the couch. But the, the point is, uh, I, I, w we will give pushback to people who think that humans and animals are the same, even though we can find some common ground. I do not think humans and animals are morally equal, even though I think we should treat animals um, well, uh, given the kinds of things that they can do. So sometimes what happens at this point of the conversation is we, as I have pointed out, the squirrel problem. Saying that being minimally aware of the world around you means that squirrels are now in the equal right to life circle, as well, and cockroaches too. Like, this is a big problem. This is not, I don't think this is the world that I live in. And this is like our pushback. Sometimes what happens here is they change targets. They will see the problem and they'll be like, oh, okay, we don't, I don't want a squirrel problem. So they'll raise the bar, li like literally. They'll like find a, try to find a more advanced thing that they could pin personhood on so that they can not have the squirrel problem. So they might say, okay, well, you need to be self-aware. And I'll say, what do you mean by self-aware? Because I've heard like 20 different definitions. Like, like let them define their, the, the, the terms that they use. Um, I can work with whatever they say. So let's say they say like, you need to be aware that you're a unique entity that will exist over a period of time. Cool, okay, let's work with that. Shoe shooting, cockroach, squirrel, elephant, newborn, toddler, adult woman. How many things go in the equal right to life circle? Because I count three, the adult woman, the toddler, and the elephant, but not the newborn. Because newborns are not self-aware like that until probably somewhere between three and six months after birth. Whereas elephants are one of the few animals that pass a lot of self-awareness tests. For example, if you put a red dot on the forehead of, uh, of an elephant and put it in front of a mirror, it will use its trunk to rub at the dot. That indicates that it can tell that it's looking at its own reflection and not a similar looking elephant. They also mourn their dead in really interesting ways. They'll have a whole like a grave site sort of memorial service, burial service, and then leave and come back even years later and have another memorial service for that dead elephant. That indicates to me and a lot of people uh, that elephants are somewhat self-aware and aware of their existence over a period of time. So. This view, that self-awareness is what gets you into the equal right to life circle, has two problems. See, all the pro-choice views have at least one of these two problems. They either let too many things into the equal right to life circle, like squirrels, or they exclude too many things, like newborns. These are always the problems that we're pointing out. I'll say it again. They are either including too many things into the circle, 
like squirrels, or the entire animal kingdom sometimes, depending on their definition, or they're excluding too many things that obviously are in the circle, like newborns. So uh, we will point that out. We will push very hard. It seems like in this view, newborns don't get a right to life. Uh, elephants do. And I don't think we should kill elephants, by the way. I, I don't think that elephants are equal with humans. In other words, if 50 elephants were like rounded together in a field and killed, I think that would be really morally wrong. But I don't think it would be as wrong as if 50 humans were rounded up in a field and killed. Okay, that's, that's the distinction for me. Um, so the elephants we give has, is in the equal right to life circle now, and the newborn is not. These are two big problems. We'll push hard against both. Now, there are other things that we can say. A lot of times we can talk about interesting temporary coma cases and other things. What I'm saying is that in our experiences, um, just between my brother and I, we've had about 3,000 conversations now with pro-choice people. From our experiences, pointing out these two problems is more persuasive. Remember, that's what we're interested in. Is what is actually going to connect with pro-choice people? So we are pointing out these problems. So to sum up, we're, trying to sh uh, we're, we're asking people to think about this obvious case of persons. Instead of like starting with the unborn, we're taking a little break. Let's think about human adults. Let's go deeper on that. Why do they even have an equal right to life? Well, it seems like for this to give them an equal right to life, they must all have something in common, something that they all have equally. What could that thing be? I think it's something like humanness. Um, they might think it's something else. And when they point out these kind of uh, alternative views, whether it's viability or ability to feel pain or able to think or like all of these different things that we hear, we're just going to think about that in the context of the Jew shooting analogy. How many things are in the equal right to life circle under their worldview? And we will point out when their view includes too many things like squirrels or excludes too many things like newborns and try to show them that it seems like the view that makes the most sense based on the world around us and, and people's kind of uh, intuitions when their moral compass is working well, um, it seems like their views are far worse than the pro-life view that we should treat humans equally. I'd be happy to take your questions now. So there's going to be a microphone that's going to be roving. And if you don't have questions, I'll just start answering the most common questions that I get after these speeches, because I just did two of these talks in the last couple of weeks. In the back. OK, so. Um did you define humanness? Yeah, so. And, I, and why does the fetus have humanness? Yeah, so this is a good question. I kind of thought this might come up. So you might have noticed that I was a bit vague in my answer about what we all have equally. I said something like humanness, and I did that on purpose. I used to say humanness. I no longer think it's exactly humanness. For reasons that are pretty philosophically in the weeds uh, that like we could kind of expand on for like 20 minutes or something like that. But I think like for, for, for the uh, purpose of, of, of today, um, I don't think it's exactly humanist. And I, I agree with um, most of the you know, like religious pro-life philosophers who are all pointing to something else, something like member of a rational kind or something that can intrinsic, like has the intrinsic ability to think and act morally, something like that, something, a more philosophically nuanced definition um, that, that doesn't have some of the philosophical issues that straight up humanist has. Here's the interesting thing, though. I tested at UC Davis, that really volatile outreach, I tested just telling people when they asked, what do I think it is, going straight to the most nuanced definition, partly because I kind of wanted to show off a little bit. Because I thought maybe, like, these people are so angry and disrespectful. Maybe if I kind of show off my vocabulary a little bit or so, like, clearly we've been thinking about this for a long time, maybe they would kind of calm down or back off a little bit and, like, take us a little bit more seriously. Um, it, was a, it was a good idea. It totally failed. Failed miserably. Um, because what happens in, with 99% of pro-choice people, uh, when you say that, then the conversation gets sidetracked. Um, they, for example, I'll say, I think you need to be, have the intrinsic ability to think and act morally. It's kind of the definition that we're playing around with right now. And they'll hear the word morally and be like, oh, let's talk about moral relativism. Okay, that's not what I want to talk about. If I can at all avoid talking about relativism, I'm going to talk about, I'm going to avoid that. And we don't even talk to that, as that many relativists on campuses these days. Talk to far more utilitarians. I think relativism is slowly dying, at least on college campuses, which is great news. But it's being replaced by utilitarianism. Anyway, we could talk about that more if you want. Um, but that's what's going on college campuses. 
So we would, the conversation would get sidetracked on these different things, or they wouldn't be able to follow the nuanced philosophical distinctions that you have to be able to parse out when going with that more uh, nuanced definition. So for 99% of people, for the sake of the dialogue, for the sake of being helpful to them, I'm giving an intentionally kind of a vague answer and almost no one even notices. I say something like humanist because what the answer that I actually think it is is really, really close to humanist, at least for practical purposes. It's more persuasive for them. And if I'm talking to a philosophy professor who says, yeah, well, what about Vulcans or whatever? One of the questions that will come up when you say humanist, I'll say, all right, you got me. I'm being a little bit intentionally vague. If you want to go straight up, if we want to go like down another level uh, towards my philosophical, my metaphysical basement, all right, we can, we can talk about that. Um, so when, what I'm talking about, when I say something like humanist, what I'm saying is something like biological humanists, which we know the unborn have simply because they have human parents. Like there's no way for two humans to get together and have sex and come up with a non-human. Like it's not going to happen. And so like that is something we kind of like it's not even a philosophical definition. It's a biological definition, which is very, very clear. Um, and, we're, and we're arguing that something like that gets you in because that makes a lot more sense than all the other views. Yeah, Josh, we have a question from Facebook Live. Uh, they asked um, in regards to um, teenagers, mm -hmm. uh, it seems like the equal rights argument may be a little bit maybe over their head. Mm -hmm. uh, so what has been your experience with um, being able to equip teenagers with the, the equal rights argument? Yeah, it's a fantastic question. So this is something that, that you know Steve Wagner and his team and Tim and I were talking a lot about as we first started testing the equal rights argument. There are simpler personate arguments out there, in, including one that I spent most of my career teaching. Um, and given that they're simpler, uh, I think the best argument for just teaching those arguments is going to be something like they're easier to learn, at least if you're young. Kind of give, like, you know, think of those arguments as like a stepping stool. Um, and basically, where we've come down is this. Given the fact that in uh, our, not only our experience, but a lot of people's experiences, we're talking about hundreds of tests now all over the country where this has worked so much better than any other argument we've tried, even, even simpler arguments that we've tried, we think it's worth the cost. It's basically worth um, trying to teach teens something that's a little bit more advanced. It's not that hard. Um, when we don't get into the Vulcan thing, this is not that hard of an argument. It's a little bit, it's a little bit harder than, than some others, but it's not, I don't think it's so hard that teenagers can't learn it. And I know that because I've taught teenagers who have then been able to use it, or teenagers that have changed their mind because of it. So I think it's worth uh, kind of basically uh, bringing teens up a level intellectually and say, Learn this argument with me. You can totally do this. I believe in you. You can do this. We're gonna. Th we're, I, may, I maybe stretched you just a little bit, um, but it's worth it because if you can master this argument, when you actually go and talk to pro-choice people, this will be far more likely to change their minds about one of the most important moral issues of our day. It's worth getting a little bit philosophical if we can change far more minds about abortion. Great question, though. In the front. I'll just ask what, this not necessarily to do with equal rights, but how you respond to another argument. How do you respond to the argument about viability? Yeah. The idea that somehow, oh yeah, we should protect the life of the unborn if they're at a point where they could live outside the womb, but if they're completely dependent on their mother for survival, uh, then, then really the mothers should have more choice over yeah. what happens. Yeah. Um, great question. So when someone says that they believe that viability is the thing that gets you in the like the equal right to life circle, um, one thing I'll point out is, okay, well, what's the definition of viability? The definition of viability is able to survive outside of a uterus. Well, that has a squirrel problem. Squirrels are able to survive outside uteruses. Like, almost, like almost all animals are able to survive outside uteruses. So one, they've got the big squirrel problem. Uh, new, newborns are in because newborns, by definition, survive outside uteruses. But most animals also do. So there's that problem. Sometimes we'll also like, I might have the opportunity to kind of throw a couple of things at them figuratively, if you will. Um, so like, I think viability is the weirdest of all the different uh, attempts at defining person because it is the only moving target. It's a target that's moving as our technology gets better. It used to be that you had about a 50% chance of survival at 26 weeks. Now it's 23 weeks. According to March of Dimes, you have a 50% chance as a preemie at 23 weeks. Youngest child was to survive was, I think, 18 weeks and six days. That's rare, though. That's not common. Uh, but at 23 weeks, you've got about a 50% chance. 
Um, so like that's kind of where, but like, so you've got this moving line. And so like if viability is actually the thing, we can start pointing out like how weird the world is now. If that's the thing that makes you a person, then you could have a woman get on a plane in a first world country where we have the technology to save uh, 23 week babies and do a transatlantic flight somewhere else where they don't have that technology. And now the personhood has changed during the flight. That's weird. That's metaphysically like that should not be our view. So like there's other things that we can point out. A lot of times when they point out something like viability, they might actually be trying to get at bodily rights arguments. They might be trying to say, because it's in, a, in her body and it's not viable, um, and it's, like, uh, it's got this very particular kind of a relationship with the mom's body, she should be able to kill it even if it is a person. And that's a completely different category of pro-choice arguments that I think a lot of pro-life people um, miss even when they hear it. Um, and a lot of our work, in fact, my most common college lecture these days is helping people, both pro-life and pro-choice people, to understand and respond to not just the like kind of philosophically lame versions of this argument, but the really strong, interesting pro-choice kind of nuanced versions of that argument. So multiple things might be going on there. I'd have to ask some clarification questions to find out where they're coming from and then respond accordingly. Before the next question, I almost forgot. I'm just gonna give you a real, a real quick ad for where you can go if you want to learn more from us. And then we should have more time for questions, which I'm excited about. Um, we created a course last year because my goal is to help the pro-life movement basically to become more like Jesus when they talk to pro-choice people. I can't do that if I'm only talking uh, to the people that I get in front of uh, physically. Um, we don't have enough staff you know, or nearly enough time in the world to do that. So we did what a lot of very smart people have done um, and created an online course for this. It's only 39 bucks. If you're an individual that's like, I want to learn systematically all the most important things that the staff at Equal Rights Institute have learned after over 3,000 conversations, this is the best place to go. If you're really cheap and don't want to spend any money, you can go to our blog. There's 150 articles at our blog. There's, there's some really, really good content there, but it's not going to be organized like this. This is uh, a, a HD video is really proud of it. Um, it's about 14 hours of content right now because uh, along with the videos, there's also a podcast, a long roundtable type podcast that we put out every other week with some really interesting topics. I'm so proud of that. Um, so that would be the best place. If you're like, ooh, these guys are interesting. I want to learn what they've been learning on college campuses these days. What arguments are working, what arguments are not. Uh, we, there's a lot of information about that, including bodily rights arguments, how to respond to utilitarianism, and even the nitty-gritty practical dialogue tips, like body language and what kinds of questions not to ask, things like that, that can not only help your pro-life conversations, but your conversations about everything, like your conversation with your spouse, with your kids, with you know, talking about religion, whatever. Um, and if you want to follow us on social media, certainly we're on Facebook and Twitter, and we've got a website, and you can subscribe to our emails and stuff like that. So, all right, add over... I'd be happy to take more questions. What else do you have? I have a, awesome. I have a question. Um, so at, as you mentioned at the beginning, the argument for uh, pro-life is going to be changing all the time as the culture changes. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like sort of the utilitarian mindset is going to continue for the next decade or so? Or do you feel like there's something newer that's, I mean, obviously you're hmm. kind of at the front edge of teens, college students. Where do you see that next kind of cultural movement taking us for the pro-life movement? That is a great question, and you are literally the first person to ever ask me that question. That is so good. Um, so, uh, like, what might come after you, you, you utilitarianism? I don't know. I suspect utilitarianism will take hold and will take hold for, a, for longer than a decade um, because it makes a lot more sense than relativism. Uh, like, I'm not the first person to have predicted that relativism would slowly die because it is on its face so ridiculous. Um, and so it's not weird to me that I'm not talking to that many relativists anymore. Um, and it makes a lot of sense to me that I'm talking to utilitarians. Um, utilitarianism is an objective moral worldview. So if utilitarians, unlike relativists, can actually say rape is wrong. They've got a way of saying rape is wrong. They're just using the wrong uh, sort of algebraic equation to get there. So utilitarianism makes a lot of sense to people because one, it's objective, and two, it does get right answers sometimes. It gets right answers like a stopped clock does. Like occasionally it's accidentally right, but not because it was using the right reasoning. But it certainly makes a lot more sense and it's taught in so many like movies and TV shows. Every time Jack Bauer ever tortured someone, it was because of utilitarian reasoning. Um, and so when we uh, talk to people who are utilitarians, we're at that point, we basically drop abortion and we make a full frontal assault against utilitarianism because 
uh, I'm, I'm not going to make too many people pro-life if they're starting from utilitarianism. Like, what I, what I want to do is try to help them think better about morality and show them uh, I've got views, like being anti-torture, that I can have as a non-utilitarian, but they can't have, even though they want to have, because they're probably liberal. It's like, they're like, we already agree on all the, like, a lot of these topics, like being anti-torture, anti-capital punishment. So I can say, like, look, I can have those views, but you can't if you're starting from utilitarian reasoning and show them that. And a lot of times we can at least get them thinking about maybe changing their entire moral worldview. Again, we've got kind of the, the ways that we respond uh, and some of the thought experiments that we use are part of the course. You can get at equippedcourse.com. Thank you so much for your time and your attention. God bless.